Good morning, Tarin. Hi. Welcome. The floor is Thank yours. Thank you. Hi, thanks. So uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, give a talk on uh, uh, managing soil health concept practices, but it will be from the remote sensing perspectives. Um, there's a lot of uh, work that has been done on uh, soil health assessment, and I will start with a general introduction on what is soil health and how can we measure soil health. And then I will uh, go to different uh, uh, projects and works that we did in the past 10 years on uh, uh, monitoring and assessing uh, soil health based on remote sensing, hyperspectral remote sensing. And I will explain what is the difference. So before I will start, uh, I will present my lab. My lab is the Agroinformatic Lab in the Agriculture Engineering Institute. And in my lab, we're dealing with uh, several topics of precision agriculture, plant and soil spectroscopy, and forest and agriculture respond to climatic change. And we've got different uh, uh, research uh, uh, work that we're doing. Uh, so the talk today will be on a very uh, small part of the, the things that they were applying in, in my lab. And it will be mainly the focus on soil quality assessment uh, by uh, uh, spectroscopy or by imaging spectroscopy. I will talk a bit about uh, how we can assess soil erosion. Uh, and I will uh, give an example of a, a work that we're currently doing on assessing soil erosion. So when we're talking about the, the global problem of soils, so it's uh, clear that the soil are uh, starting to, to be a, a, an issue. So. Uh, if we're talking about soil erosion, uh, we're talking about between 20 to 30 billion tons per year of soil that uh, is lost. This is a, a huge amount of soil that we're losing, but it's not just soil erosion. It's also, also soil degradation and deterioration, reduction in their variability, uh, salinization, um, compaction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And, uh, and soil that are becoming more and more uh, um, uh, polluted. So, um, for, uh, for, uh, for, for evaluating those processes uh, and mitigating those processes, we need uh, to develop uh, ways to, uh, first of all, uh, assess their health. And I will explain shortly what is soil health because it's a, it's a very uh, a difficult definition to, to, to assess. And we need to develop tools, tools to map, tools to monitor uh, uh, those uh, degraded processes from point, point scale to uh, regional scale. So when we're talking about uh, um, soil health, the definition by the Soil Science Society of America is uh, soil quality uh, defined as the capacity of soil to function as a vital living system within an ecosystem or land use boundaries to sustain plant and animal productivity, maintain or enhance water and air quality and promote plant and animal health. It means that the ability to, of soil to function and to support different, uh, uh, different ecosystem services uh, to support uh, plant and productivity. And uh, when we're talking about the capacity of specific kind of soil to function, so functions are supported by processes and processes are affected by state variables. And basically what we need to do is we need to uh, define indicator that can represent the relative state or process of those uh, 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 processes that we want to evaluate. And this is exactly what uh, soil health trying to uh, accomplish. Basically, what we want to do is we want to evaluate indicator or select indicator that, that can represent the state and processes variables uh, of soils. Uh, this is a nice example that was published in 2008. And since then, since then a lot of work has been done on uh, different indexes and different models that were, were developed uh, for evaluating indicator for natural agriculture and polluted soil uh, to evaluate soil health. And basically this is a complex issue because what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a holistic approach of integrating different parameters of the soil, biological, chemical, and physical uh, properties to evaluate the overall health of the soil. 
And this is something that, of, of course, affected from environmental condition and climatical condition, et cetera, and the management that uh, we are applying on the soil. So there are several um, um, models or uh, um, um, suggested approach uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, one of the examples is the Cornell uh, Soil Health Test, uh, which basically what they did is they tried to develop uh, several uh, indicators that can represent the overall health of the soil. Uh, they selected physical, biological, and chemical properties. And here you can see that they selected, uh, for example, available water uh, uh, capacity, surface hardness in different level, aggregation stability of organic matter, soil protein, respiration, a parameter that can represent, represent different processes that occur in, in, in the soil. And basically based on a model that I will explain later on how this model works, they can give scores or they can give uh, the level of, uh, um, 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 level of health of the soil. Usually it range between zero to one, between uh, zero to 100. 100, it means that the soil is, uh, is okay and uh, the power method that we want to evaluate is, uh, is uh, functioning okay. Uh, or uh, if we've got a very low uh, index, means that uh, we've got a problem and we need to try to solve the specific problem. This is one example. This is an example that mainly works on agricultural system. Uh, uh, they give support to farmers that want to evaluate their quality of the soil and what is the problem in their specific soil. And they uh, given them uh, this report at the end of the analysis, which the, they can uh, evaluate the level of degradation in their soil and what are their what what are the specific causes for that uh, that reason. Another example is the SMAF, the Soil Management Assessment Framework which is more general and it's less relevant to agricultural system. It can work also in natural system. And uh, basically the approach is that we've got a uh, different management and we can select from 81 the uh, potential indicators, uh, the way to assess uh, the soil and to evaluate the, the, the overall function or the overall services that the soil can, uh, can support. And in here, this is, a, this is an example of the processes to develop soil quality index or soil quality uh, health assessment. So basically it's a three stage uh, process where the first one is selecting the indicator. Uh, the main idea is to select the relevant indicator and, and not to select too many soil properties for, for that we're using a minimum data set soil attribute. Uh, and there are different, way to different ways to select those uh, properties. We can use expert knowledge, uh, we can develop decision tree, or we can use the statistical approach uh, to evaluate what are the relevant uh, indicator to uh, assess the specific management that we want to monitor. The next step is basically to uh, uh, normalize all the parameters that we are uh, evaluating. And usually it's by uh, uh, developing scoring function. It could be categorical or numerical scale. The transformation is usually use uh, three function of more is the better, this is the better and optimum function, which could be based on linear transformation or based on nonlinear transformation. And after we transform those uh, scoring function that they, they were all, the all properties, properties will range from zero to one, then we need to sum the overall uh, properties to evaluate the overall soil health. And the summing is also something that can be done by different approach. It could be used by, it could be done by expert knowledge. It can be done by weighting the different uh, properties to evaluate the weight or the importance of each one of the uh, soil factors. And uh, eventually uh, we are receiving the overall soil health index, which usually divided to physical, biological, and chemical soil properties. Another very important uh, part of this, uh, you know, this stage is to look at the collinearity that we've got between the different properties, because it's uh, well known that the soil properties are interrelated and correlated between themselves. And we reduce the, uh, the properties that are highly correlated and then we can uh, plug inside to the model just the uh, uh, properties or the, the indicators that are relevant to the management that we want to assess. 
So this is the general framework and it works for most of the uh, models that, was, that were developed in the past uh, several years. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, relatively flexible and you can decide if you want to be more on the um, um, safe side and to use the statistical approach or if you can um, uh, be more holistic and uh, look on the expert opinion in the different, uh, different uh, stages of the development of the soil health index. So basically, uh, this is an example for the, the Cornell soil health test. So we're selecting uh, several indicator, aggregate stability, available water content, et cetera, et cetera, biological, physical, and chemical properties. And the overall integration of all of them is, is uh, the soil functioning of soil health. Um, and this is, of course, based on previous work where they took more than 300 different soil indicators uh, and select based on uh, different uh, expert knowledge and based on different statistical modeling, the relevant properties for evaluating the management of agricultural soils. And this is important to mention that this model is relevant to agricultural soils. And there is, uh, when, we're, we're, when we're moving to other management or other uh, uh, properties that we want to evaluate, so we need to select different indicators. And this is a flexible and very important uh, part that we need to understand. The next step is the, the scoring function, and you can see the transformation function. And usually, for example, if we want to transform, um, uh, to use the, the function of uh, more is the better, so using the, um, for example, soil organic matter is uh, usually used uh, more as the better function. Optimum function usually uh, we use uh, on pH, et cetera, et cetera. Right. There, there are uh, uh, different uh, transformation function for each one of the soil properties that we are selecting. And then the way to sum them all, it could be done by just summing them and dividing them by the number of properties or by weighting them and then uh, summing the, the overall properties, but the overall index can give us a, a relative uh, um, understanding of the, the level of the health of the function of the soil that we are working with. So what is the problem? <laughs> if we want to take this uh, another step and to look on soil, uh, soil quality or soil health assessment beyond the field scale, we need to understand that we need to develop tools that will uh, assist us to uh, look on the, the uh, to look on the uh, regional uh, regional scale. This is a, a time uh, and very expensive work to develop a soil health assessment. Usually, we're measuring between uh, ten to twenty soil properties for each soil samples, uh, very labeling. And in here, uh, the remote sensing uh, part is uh, coming into the, the frame. So usually when we're talking about the chemical analysis, the chemical analysis require lab and field work, extensive lab, lab and field work. And we can uh, look on those different soil properties by using uh, different tools that are based on remote sensing. Usually we're talking about hyperspectral remote sensing and usually we need to use a spectral range that uh, range between the 400 and 2,500 nanometers. Uh, when we are measuring, uh, uh, when we're talking about remote sensing is of course uh, with no physical content. Uh, we are trying to evaluate the electromagnetic radiance or the reflectance of the specific element that we want to measure. And we're using different sensor cameras uh, and to, to evaluate the, the reflectant level. Usually we are measuring a, a, the intensity of the radiation and we transform it to reflectance. And, uh, and it's mainly dependent on this, uh, the, the level or the accuracy of the sensor that we are using. So we've got a different sensor. We can uh, work with the lab spectro spectrometers or an analytical spectral device in the field or in the lab. We can work with uh, uh, different tools that use uh, like, uh, the, like the XRF. We can use platform, moving platform in the field uh, with uh, uh, cameras that can uh, look on the plant or on the soil. Uh, we can uh, use sensor that can penetrate the soil and they've got a specific illumination like the example that we've got in here. Basically, they've got a, 
a spectrometer that's penetrating the soil with a, a self illumination, and they can evaluate uh, in different depth uh, the, the overall carbon estimation uh, in the field in different levels. So the, the meaning of, of those tools is that we can use them to map or to assess the different, uh, different soil properties. Uh, oops, just a second. Okay, so it's all based on the, the concept of the spectral signature that we can evaluate different properties uh, from the soil spectral signature. And here you can see an example so of several uh, spectral signature of the reflectance of, the, of different soils. And you can see that we've got a specific absorption feature that are related to different uh, properties in the soil. The same way is uh, with plants. Uh, when we're looking on the spectral signature of plant, we can identify the concentration of different level that related to, uh, uh, to uh, um, different parameter of the plant. But in here, we're looking on, on the soil. And you can see that we've got absorption feature that related to water content, or to clay, or to organic matter, or to uh, iron uh, content, et cetera, et cetera. And based on those absorption feature or overtones that we can evaluate based on spectral signature, we can evaluate the concentration of each one of those parameters in the soil. Uh, when we move into the larger scale, so we can use drones with hyperspectral sensors. We can use air bombs and we can use satellites. And of course, the satellites that are relevant for soil monitoring are totally different from the regular satellite because we need a hyperspectral satellite like a, a, a different satellite that are about to be launched in the coming, in the coming years, like Shalom and additional satellite that are uh, uh, with the uh, accurate spectral, spectral range and spectral reg resolution for, for monitoring soils. And when we're talking about uh, imaging spectroscopy or hyperspectral imaging spectroscopy, usually we're looking on the hyperspectral cubic. The hyperspectral cubic is if we had a point spectrometer, which uh, taking a specific spectral measurement on the, the surface or the soil that we, uh, we brought to the lab or in the field. In here, we're talking about a map where we've got X, Y, and Z. The X and the Y is the location of the specific pixel. And the Z is its spectral signature. And basically, we can uh, uh, look on spectral signature of soils and vegetation and learn about their chemistry and physical properties uh, and map them. And this is the uh, other level of, uh, of working with uh, uh, imaging spectroscopy or spectroscopy application. So basically, we can uh, move for, from proximal sensing or mobile sensor or static sensor to laboratory analysis where they are very accurate and uh, to move to airborne and satellite data. For each one of those platform, we've got uh, advantages and disadvantages that we need to be aware of. But basically, when we've got the spectral signature, we can look on the different absorption feature and extract from them uh, uh, information about, uh, about the soil surface. One of the amazing examples that uh, have been used with uh, imaging spectroscopy is the uh, moon mapping. And I don't know if you're aware of the M3 uh, mission, which basically what they did, they use uh, imaging spectroscopy and thermal data to evaluate the uh, uh, water and mineral content, content of the moon. And uh, uh, based on, on those imagery, they can uh, uh, start understanding how and what we've got on the moon. So it's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing the abilities of those, uh, those imaging spectroscopy system. And it's also very complicated because we're talking about large amount of data and, and processing uh, and abilities that need to be, to be applied. So in the coming uh, uh, time that I've got, I'm going to talk about uh, four different topics. The first one will be an, an example of uh, assessing soil health on the uh, restorated uh, mining area, just to, to understand the process that we need to do to develop this uh, um, uh, quality index. 
The next step will be to represent the uh, different soil properties and soil health assessment that we can uh, apply based on soil spectroscopy in the lab, mainly in the lab, but uh, partially in, uh, from the field. And then I will move to the larger scale and uh, give some examples of the uh, mapping of soil quality uh, using urban imaging spectroscopy. And then I will show a short example of the additional work that we're doing uh, for mapping soil erosion and to assess the, the level of soil erosions based on LIDAR and SAR data. So we'll start. Um, this work, uh, it's a uh, work that we're currently working on. Uh, we've got a, a hyperspectral strip of uh, 20 kilometer in uh, the tin phosphate mine uh, in a hyper-arid environment. But I'm not going to talk about the processes that we did with the hyperspectral image. I'm going to uh, show you the uh, rationality and the process that uh, need to be done for evaluating a, a soil health assessment in for example, phosphate mine. Uh, and when we are talking about uh, restoration of phosphate mine, we've got different level of restoration. We've got reclamation that uh, mainly related to a, a, a topographical a, 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 a organization or mainly to return the soil to its original surface or original topography. Rehabilitation usually seek to, um, uh, seek to transfer the soil to different uh, state or to different function, to different land use. And restoration seek to uh, 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 return the soil to its original condition. And usually this is a much, uh, much, com much uh, complicated process because what we need to do is we need to restore the soil, to restore its function, to restore its biological chemical properties. This is a, a process that uh, takes, takes time. So in here, uh, what we did is, first of all, we tried to see what are the indicators, or what are the properties that can, uh, can be used for evaluate a successful uh, mining restoration. And there are several, uh, several approach. Soil quality assessment is one of them, but there are uh, enzyme activity and litter accumulation, plant cover and species composition and phenol communities and microbial communities, and et cetera, et cetera, that can represent the level of restoration in those, uh, those areas that were totally distracted by machinery and then uh, placed back, back to, uh, to their original, uh, original place. So the area that we're working is the tin phosphate mine. This is a phosphate mine that uh, started to, uh, in the 70s. Uh, in, the past, uh, in the past 20 years, uh, this uh, mining area has started to be uh, more toward the ecological restoration approach, where they're restoring the topsoil of the soil. Uh, the topsoil is usually the 15 uh, centimeter of the soil. Uh, and basically what the, what the, the, the process means is that they're uh, uh, digging a pit and moving the phosphate layer that are relevant uh, uh, for, uh, for the, the the factory process, and then they're pulling, uh, put, putting back the, the, the filling from the previous pit that they dug, and then they're putting the topsoil layer from the previous pit they dug. So it, it means that there is a lot of shuffling of soil in those area. And basically what we wanted to see is if the soil can restore once, once we are uh, restoring the topsoil to the area, if we can identify the restoration process. And we selected three sites, the Gov, Afik, and Chabor, those uh, the three sites, which, each one, which uh, each one of them was restored from the different uh, period, 2007, 2008, and 2014. And basically what we did is we took soil samples from natural environment that were adjusted, adjusted to the uh, uh, restoration uh, area. This is how it looks like. So basically, we had a, a 20 soil sample from each site, uh, the natural and the restored site. And uh, uh, we used those. Uh, we overall, we had 80 soil samples. And we used those to evaluate uh, the uh, soil, uh, soil health or soil quality. The next step was selecting the data that we want to evaluate, the minimum data set. So as I mentioned previously, the first step for developing soil health assessment is to selecting the 
relevant soil properties to evaluate the management. And usually it's a relative uh, index, a relative index that we compare the, uh, in the state that we want to, uh, to be in, the natural state versus the restored state. And in here, you can see all the properties that we selected, the physical, the chemical, the biological properties, and the cause or the reason why those are essential properties. And I want to mention mainly the biological properties. We're talking about a hyper-arid environment. Uh, usually, it's very poor in organic matter. And one of the parameters that we thought that it's, it would be highly important is the, the soil organic matter, but not just the soil organic matter, but also uh, things that represent the biological community or the soil biological community in, in this arid environment. We know the importance of bioparts in this environment. So uh, we looked on protein and polysaccharides uh, uh, to assess the, the level of uh, restoration of the biological properties. The next step was basically to develop the scoring function and the correlation between those different uh, properties to see if we can find some pattern, some uh, uh, rationale in the, the different soil properties. And you can see that there are several properties that are uh, uh, much more important, like infiltration, soil organic matter, um, um, and uh, polysaccharide and proteins that can represent the variation that we got in those, uh, in those mining area. And the last step is basically to develop the soil quality assessment. Uh, in here, you can see that in most of the area, we identified a reduction in the mining and in the rest of restored area. Uh, and, and you can see that there is also the effect of the time. So, for example, the Gov, which was the uh, previous uh, site that was restored uh, from 2007, uh, uh, we didn't find significant differences between the natural and the restored site. However, in, uh, in the Chabor and the Fix site, we found uh, significant dif uh, differences. And uh, the most important differences were mainly in the biological properties. So it means that the, the first part that we need to look on when we're, when we're talking about the uh, restoration success in a hyper-arid environment is basically to look on the uh, biological properties in the level of soil organic matter, on the level of uh, um, uh, polysaccharide and uh, the uh, functional group that we've got uh, that related to biocrust or related to the development of biocrust, which stabilize the soil, which prevents soil erosion, etc. etc. So basically, uh, the soil health assessment is something that can be applied in agricultural system, but it, it could also be applied in other system uh, uh, like uh, restoration, uh, the success of restoration, like uh, polluted soil and the level of uh, pollution that we've got in the soil uh, and what are the specific parameters that are relevant to evaluate those, uh, those properties. And now we'll move to the remote sensing part. So this is the process that we need to do for developing a soil health assessment. And it's highly complicated, highly expensive, uh, require a large amount of soil analysis. And this is the rationale of using soil spectroscopy to characterize uh, soil properties and health. Uh, so basically, uh, we started uh, working on this concept uh, uh, several years ago. And basically what we're doing is we're taking a laboratory analysis, we are taking spectral analysis, we're developing a, a multi-statistical uh, approaches to link between uh, the spectral sign signal and the biologi biological, chemical, and physical properties. In here, we use a model that is based on partial square regression and, and discriminant analysis. Um, discriminant analysis is classifying the data, uh, regression is taking uh, the correlation between the different properties. And we developed the overall uh, uh, soil quality index and the spectral soil quality index. So just by spectral, we can evaluate the quality of the soil. And again, it's related to uh, the main idea that uh, in, uh, when we're looking on spectral signature of soil, we can uh, uh, find uh, tones and overtones of different uh, chemical relations uh, in the soil that mainly related to uh, carbon, nitrogen, uh, and, and specific uh, element in the soil. And when we are taking the when we are taking the overall soil signature, so the overall soil soil signature can be used 
to assess the overall health of the soil. And this is the main idea. So spectral signature can represent the overall health of, uh, of the soil based on its chemical composition. Uh, so there are uh, a lot of protocols of, of how we need to assess the, the spectral uh, information from the soil, and it's very important because if we want to develop a standardization approach, so we need to work in a specific way uh, to evaluate the spectral signal as we are working in, a, in a chemical labs, there are protocol of acquiring the data and how we need to acquire the data. And once we acquiring the data, uh, uh, we're starting to develop model. This is, a, for example, a review that we did on uh, different soil properties and PK, water content, pH, and EC. You can see that uh, uh, for each parameter, they worked, uh, they worked in, uh, with a different sensor, a different spectral range, different algorithm, which each one of them can give, can give us a totally different result. And this is the importance of developing protocol and developing standardization approach for a modeling a soil spectroscopy. Since if we want to compare between, uh, between soils, and so, so we have the ability to do this, those uh, evaluation processes. This is an example of a, 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 a work that we did that compared between the standard procedure, for example, of PLSR and a, a linear a multitask learning. And in here, what the, the main idea is that basically most of those soil properties are a collinear. And a, if we will take all of those pro properties together, we can improve the ability of predicting soil properties since they've got a specific areas and specific locations, specific spectral location. And in here, you can see the VIP, the importance of the peaks or the importance of the spectral signal. And you can use the, those importance, importance of the spectral signal to develop the models. And what we can see in here that in most of the soil properties, the same spectral signal is uh, 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 seems to be the, uh, uh, important. And you can see that we've got those, uh, those uh, location. Um, sometimes we've got specific absorption features. And when we've got a specific absor absorption features, it could be an indicator, a very good indicator for evaluate, for example, water content or additional parameter. But the main idea is that we need to remember that in most, of, most of the properties are a, a collinear and interrelated uh, inter, uh, to one another in the spectral signal also. And basically, when we're talking on the spectral signal, the, the additional uh, issue is that we need to apply different uh, pre-processing transformation to enhance the spectral signal. One of the problems that we've got with spectral signal is that they are very similar. It seems like the spectral signal looks totally uh, similar if we would look on, the, on, the, on this figure. But when we are applying a transformation application, so then we can start to see the variation that we've got in the spectral signal, which are very important to evaluate the concentration of, the, of different chemical properties. And based on uh, this variation, we can develop a classification approach to dis distinguish between different soils. The next step is basically to develop a, a, a correlations, a, a multi-correlation approach. And in here you can see that basically based on spectroscopy, we can predict most of the soil properties with a very good accuracy. And the most important issue is that we can predict soil quality with a very yeah, a high accuracy. So it means that just based on a spectral signal, if we will have enough spectral signals of uh, soils, we can evaluate their uh, nitrogen level or water content level or soil organic level, et cetera, et cetera. And if we'll develop a model uh, to assess also soil quality, just based on the spectral signal, we can evaluate also the overall soil health or soil quality of the, of the soils. And this is taking me to the next level of the, of the work that we're uh, uh, thinking of doing, which is using uh, spectral soil libraries. And today we've got a lot of spectral soil libraries that uh, were developed uh, worldwide. 
This is one of the examples of the Global Spectral Library, which uh, characterizing the world spectral uh, data. Uh, usually in those uh, spectral libraries, we've got uh, uh, hundreds of spectral information that were collected. Uh, the data is collected based on protocols and based on standard procedures. Uh, and we've got all the chemical analysis that uh, uh, were collected in the different location. And this is uh, one example of, uh, um, of the, the spectral soil libraries that we've got. So we've got the world, the world soil information. Uh, we've got, uh, for example, the land cover land use uh, statistical survey uh, of uh, Europe, where they've got more than 25,000 spect uh, spectral uh, uh, soils uh, that they collected. We've got the Brazilian soil spectral libraries. And we also got spectral libraries in Israel. This is an example of uh, the spectral library that Gil Eshel and uh, Eyal Bendor developed. And you can see that for each one of those spectral libraries, we've got different soil properties that were uh, estimated. For example, we've got physical, the biological, and chemical properties. And we can see that in some spectral libraries, we've got a, a large amount of soil properties that based on the soil properties, we can evaluate also the overall quality of those soil worldwide, just based on those data sets that were collected uh, in different locations. Uh, in Israel, one of the advantages of the spectral library that was developed in Israel is that they uh, selected to work with more than 70 uh, uh, spectral pro uh, 70 soil properties, biological, physical, and chemical soil properties. The meaning of that is that uh, we can contribute by, uh, by adding additional information and indicator of properties that are highly essential to evaluate the overall health of soils. Uh, and I think this is, a, this is an integration work that needs to be done, so we'll be able to collect those large amount of data on soils and uh, chemical properties and, and uh, try to uh, understand the effect of management, climate, environmental condition on the different aspect of soil health or soil properties in agricultural system, but not just in agricultural systems. And I will, I will move to the next step. So, uh, until now, I was talking about uh, how we can develop soil health assessment, then what is the ability of soil spectroscopy and how can we evaluate the spectral measurement of different soils. And we're scaling up and using hyperspectral data. So uh, in here, when we're talking about imaging spectroscopy, this is an example of uh, one of the strip flight that we've got on uh, soil in Nigda, for example. And basically in here, we're dealing with large amounts of data. Uh, if uh, I was talking uh, previously mainly on those two steps, in here, there's additional processes that, that need to be done. So we'll be able to map the, the soil health. And for doing so, we need to apply radiometric and atmospheric and geometric correction and mask the vegetation to look just on the soil and classify the important parts and uh, uh, smooth the pixel and reduce noise. And there's a lot of processes that need to be done. And then we need to develop accurate model like support vector machine regression, which is a machine model uh, and a machine, a machine learning algorithm and, and to train it correctly. And based on this, uh, this uh, training and application, we can develop maps of the different soil properties and the overall soil quality. Um, in, in our work, we worked with uh, the isophenic sensor in this case. Uh, I, will ex I will show you two examples of work that we did with the isophenic sensor. Uh, this is a sensor with 420 spectral band, uh, ranging between uh, 380 to 2,500 nanometer, which can give us the spectral signature of the soil. And it's very important to understand the, the shift that uh, we're doing when we're moving from point spectroscopy to imaging spectroscopy. When we're looking on a, a point spectroscopy, this is a very clear spectral signal of soil where we can identify the specific absorption feature very clearly. When we're moving to a field spectroscopy, then 
we add in additional aspects that related to water content in the soil or to the aggregation of the soil and to other elements that we've got in the soil. And when we move into imaging spectroscopy, we need to tackle problems that related to atmospherical effects and to noise and to mixed pixel, et cetera, et cetera. So this movement from point spectroscopy to imaging spectroscopy is not so simple. And in here, this is an example of a work that we did also in Germany and also in Israel uh, with, the, the same, with the same sensor. You can see all those points. Those points are basically the soil samples that we collected. And based on those soil samples, we interpolated later on and developed model to predict the different soil properties and classify the different level and eventually develop the uh, overall uh, soil health assessment. Another work that we're currently doing is in arid environment. This is a work that uh, Nathan Levy is doing uh, to evaluate also uh, those different uh, soil properties and the overall soil health. And based on the model that we developed, this is based on the, the support vector emission regression. Based on the model that we, did, that we developed, we can evaluate the specific absorption feature that are related to each one of those soil properties. And you can see the range or the spectral range that are highly important for the modeling part. And from that, we can develop, oh, it's not working, just a second, uh, uh, information about each one of those soil properties. So this table, it's uh, with huge amounts of information about the model accuracy about the, the uh, evaluation of the model, about the spectral features that are related to this model, and basically about our ability to use those models to predict the overall soil health. And eventually, we've got those maps, those, those maps that can give us a, 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 the overall soil health of a large amount of area. And this is highly important when we're talking about agricultural system, because when we're talking about agricultural system, the processes, the management, the tools that we're applying on the soil uh, can affect their overall quality and their overall function. And basically by using those uh, approaches of imaging spectroscopy based on airborne or based on uh, satellite in the coming future, uh, we'll, we'll have the ability to evaluate chemical uh, properties of soil just based on uh, just based on those models, and the final uh, the final example that I will show is uh, taking us to a different aspect that related to soil degradation. So usually, when we're talking about the uh, soil degradation, we can uh, look on the, the chemical part of the degradation of the, the composition of the soil, but also we've got a, a degradation that is based on erosion. Uh, usually when the soil is less uh, uh, clayly and we've got lower amount of soil organic matter and lower amount of aggregation, so those are usually highly uh, erodible soils. And in this case, the work that we're doing is to develop tools that are based on remote sensing to evaluate the amount, the, 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 to quantify the, the level of uh, uh, soil erosion. Uh, and uh, one of the most important issues is that uh, the management, the agricultural management that we're applying on the soil, if it's with tailing or no tailing or with cultivation and which cultivation and which depth, they're all affecting the level of uh, aridity in the soil that we've got. And in here, we, uh, we tackle this in two different levels, in the plot level and in the watershed, watershed scale level. And uh, and this is the study area that we selected. So you can see the plot that we're working on. Each plot will have different level of uh, 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 different uh, treatments that uh, uh, the standard treatments that we've got on soils. And we will also look on the overall watershed scale to see the level of, uh, of uh, soil erosion. And you can see that this is a highly agricultural system. Most of the area is with a different level of uh, cultivation of the soil in this uh, watershed. So basically the main approach is by uh, using LIDAR and I will present in a second what is a LIDAR um, and uh, using SAR, uh, which is based on satellite data. The LIDAR data is based on, uh, on uh, drones. This is a system that we bought uh, uh, two, a year ago. 
and basically based on the integrating, integrating different aspects that related to soil erosion, like slope and aspect and, and et cetera, et cetera, and the, the properties that relate to the soil, we're aiming to develop a soil erosion a map or soil, soil erosion a, a, a model that will assist us in uh, developing a special decision support system for a soil erosion assessment. So uh, I started and mentioned. I started with mentioning the lidar system. So lidar, it's basically very different from the previous sensors that I was talking about. This is an active sensor. The sensor, the hyperspectral imagery that I was mentioned previously, uh, a, a, a passive sensor uh, uh, that based on spectral uh, spectral measurements. In here, we've got a light laser beam that, uh, based on the intensity of the laser beam, we can uh, receive the, uh, the surface information in three dimension. And this is uh, basically a 3D model. Usually what we're doing is we're integrating the information on soil spectroscopy with the information that give us the structure uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the soil and we can link them. We can integrate and develop models that link between the soil health and the level of erosion in the soil. So this is something that needs to be in mind. But in here, we mainly, uh, we're mainly using the LIDAR for evaluating the rate uh, of the deposit or erosion level in the soil. Uh, this is a system that we developed uh, a year ago with the Meshach model, which is basically using a LiDAR system, a, a lightweight LiDAR system with a multispectral sensor. Um, and it's a, it's a measuring, measuring system. It's a very accurate measuring system. Uh, and the other aspect, which is the part of Offer Rosenstein in this work, is basically using the SAR system, uh, the C-band SAR system, to evaluate the watershed scale uh, level of the uh, uh, soil erosion. And I, will not, um, I don't have the time to go into it. And in here, basically, what we did is we applied different, uh, different application of management on the soil by disk, PAL, uh, system with no tailing, uh, with grazing and without grazing. Uh, this is a heavy machinery that, uh, that went into those uh, agricultural systems so will be able to evaluate the initial level, the effect of the management uh, just by uh, heavy machinery that uh, goes, into the, uh, goes into the field. Uh, and in addition, we, uh, we are evaluating the level of erosion by the standard procedure of uh, uh, catchments of the soil erosion level. So we'll be able to assess in a very high accuracy the level of uh, soil erosion. This is an example of the data of the uh, LIDAR. So in here, you, you can see the density of the pond just to have a, a general, a, a general mind on the, the, the level of the accuracy of this data. So the gray area is talking about the density of the pond. So in here we're talking about more than 200 point per square meter. So it means that we have a very high resolution information about the soil surface. And based on this very high resolution of the soil surface, we can evaluate it, the uh, accurate amount of soil that was deposited or eroded uh, from the system. And basically what we're doing is we're capturing information from the, lay, from the LIDAR uh, uh, during the different processes uh, after a rainy event and at the end of the growing season to evaluate the overall level of the soil erosion. And this is how it looks like. This is, those are points. So it's a very, very, very dense point on the, on the soil, uh, on the surface. The next step is basically using SAR system where in here, what we're doing is we're uh, using a satellite SAR, uh, which is usually very accurate in evaluating soil moisture, soil roughness, uh, and basically based on a model that uh, will evaluate the soil moisture and roughness, uh, we will be able to evaluate the overall uh, level of erosion at the watershed scale. And uh, this is the work in a progress. So I believe that the 
in the next seminar that I will present, I will be able to show you the result of uh, this uh, massive work that we're currently doing uh, to develop model for uh, soil erosion, which is based on LIDAR and SAR and, uh, and very interesting systems that we're trying to apply here. So what is the future? This is my last slide. So uh, in the short time that I have had in here, uh, mainly what I wanted to show is the abilities that we've got in soil spectroscopy for assessing soil health, which is a very important part of monitoring agricultural system and assess the level of uh, um, degradation that we've got in our soils. And basically based on the upcoming tools that are going to be developed. And here you can see a table of the missions, the satellite missions that are going to be applied with hyperspectral sensor. Basically what, what it means that we will be, have the ability to monitor soil uh, with a relatively good, uh, uh, relatively good, uh, good uh, applications of uh, satellite and imaging spectroscopy. So I hope that in the coming future, we will have the ability to apply all of those models that we develop to evaluate overall soil health. Thank you. And of course, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So that, Tarin, really interesting stuff. Thanks. Many years of work. Many years ago, um, yes. Yeah, so uh, if the audience have questions, please unmute yourselves and go ahead. Okay. Oh, I see that Gil is in here. Nice. <laughs> Hi, Gil. No questions? Oh, Shavishon. Bevadai, the Simcha. Offer, you prefer Hebrew, English? Whatever I think we have to. English speakers in the audience. Okay, so, so we will stick to English. Uh, you showed in one of your slides that the spectra for agriculture, forest, and I think grazing mm -hmm. was very, very similar. Yes. So but then I, sh but, but yes. then I, sh yes. So one of the issues with spectral signal is that they, we've got a high similarity in the spectral signal. And we need to apply processing that uh, related to PPTs. And then I showed the, on the other on the other hand the PPTs and the effect of the PPTs on the spectral Sorry, signal. The effect of what PPTs? PPTs. It's a pre-processing transformation that we're applying on the spectral signal of the soil. So basically, if you want to distinguish, uh, there there are different spectral approach like continuous removal and PPTs. So we can enhance the differences that we can identify in the spectral signal. So uh, this is something that, uh, that, that needs to be applied not just on soil signals and soil spectral signals, but also on plant signals. Uh, so we'll be able to distinguish the specific absorption area, or absorption feature that related to the chemical properties of the, the spectral signal. Yes, but still, I mean, from a physical point of view, it means that the degree of surface cover by uh, yes, yes, vegetation, yes, type yes. of vegetation, etc. basically from the reflectance do not play. So the fact that you can by mathematical manipulation distinguish between the three still doesn't give a It's not just the mathematical manipulation, it's also by the models that we develop that link between the chemical properties and between the spectral signal. Okay. Vinnie. Sorry, Anna. Yes, of course. Hi, Vinnie. Hi. Uh, thank you. It's really wonderful. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is uh, what you are able to measure is just by any method that you uh, um, uh, that you uh, described is the surface, mm -hmm. but the soil quality also. Um, is or, or another parameter is what happens in that. Yes. So what? Yeah. How how do you manage and how do you integrate those uh, parameters in in the assessment? Mm -hmm. And the second. Okay. So you'll answer that, and I'll ask the second question. Thank you. So, very good question. Thank you. Um, 
basically, um, remote sensing can sense the surface. This is uh, the limitation of remote sensing. But as I showed previously, we can develop different tools like mobile system that can penetrate the soil, that they've got the inside illumination and inside light. So uh, we can have the spectral signal of the soil in different depths. And there are different platforms that they with, taking with, yes, with that, airborne. Uh, no, 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 not, no, not with airborne, with a mobile <laughs> system. So, for example, with, a tractor that's yeah. got a sensor uh, uh, launch into it, and then it can penetrate. That, that's fine, but I'm referring to the mobile, to the airborne. So, so no, with airborne and satellite, we need to, to understand the limitation of the system. The limitation of the system is that we have the ability to monitor soil just on the surface. Another limitation that is very important is what we can see is just the surface. So if the surface is covered with plant, we don't have the ability to assess the soil. We have the ability to assess the vegetation, but not the soil. So those are those are limitation, a well-known limitation that needs to take into account when you're trying to apply those models. Yeah. And, and my second question is with the um, airborne um, imaging spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. um, I can understand the similarity. This is further to what Guy um, asked. I can understand the similarity of the spectrum in different soils of the physical and chemical parameters. Okay. Um, but biological parameters, um, the biology is so different. It depends on you know, the yes. microflora the organic matter, which is a wide range of, of uh, compounds. Yes, of course. So the, the biological properties of the soil are highly important. And by remote sensing, we won't have the ability to assess the uh, micro and micro organism that we've got in the soil. We can evaluate a, a, a indirect relationships that related to the uh, micro and macro fauna in the soil, like soil respiration, like uh, uh, polysaccharide in the soils, like different indicator that can indicate on the activity of micro and microorganisms in the soil. But this is highly important. And one of the issues is we can evaluate the micro and microorganism and uh, integrate this information with spectral information that we've got. It's something that needs to be done. It needs to be done. It needs to be evaluated. It needs to uh, be inter, uh, inter to the, the spectral, spectral evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinny. Um, I would like uh, to add some uh, comments. Hi, Gil. <laughs> Uh, I think we need, uh, and you said it well, uh, we need to separate between soil spectroscopy and soil imaging. It's the, the ability, what we can able to see between those two platforms. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I see, personally, I think that the, the future is in soil spectroscopy. There we able to, in, in lab, to replace the common uh, wet chemistry or wet uh, biology, biological assessment. Yeah. Uh, uh, the differences between soil spectroscopy in the lab to the airborne are totally different. This totally, is and, and I think people that are not familiar need to understand that it's not the same. It's totally different world. Yes. And bridge uh, those two differences uh we next 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 generations so uh, yes i totally agree well, I, i'm not so uh, optimistic about it, but, but i totally agree. i totally agree with you gil i think that uh, we need to tackle this issue with the two different approach one of the approach is using lab spectroscopy and uh, soil spectral uh, laboratory analysis uh, and develop the application of uh, spectroscopy, <clears throat> point spectroscopy, and it's very different. Point spectroscopy is very different from imaging spectroscopy. When we are talking about imaging spectroscopy, it's a totally different dimension that uh, needs to, to, to overcome a lot of problems, like penetrating the soil, like covering of vegetation, like atmospherical effect, like noise, like mixed pixel, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a lot of issues that we need to tackle, but I think that it's additional, very important uh, 
a field of research that need to be developed. So the future will be, uh, uh, will come sooner. Yeah, if you look at the, the exploration of Mars as, as an equivalent, they have satellites, they have the Mars rovers, right? And they penetrate the soil to look underneath. And now I hear they're sending a UAV. So yeah. really it's a combination of all of those approaches that will allow us to you know, find the answers. Yeah. And it's the same in uh, agricultural and natural environment. Yeah. One is not uh, replacing the other necessarily. Yes, thank you. Thank you often. Just if I can jump in, like to, to emphasize what Ofa said, if it, it makes sense because what is like hyperspectral images has also like a spatial cover which is not going for point measurements in, in the lab. So no one is perfect, but yeah. it's the advantages and disadvantages. And I think as what you are doing, Taurine, is like combining it best. That's it. Thank you. Yes, so of course there are, I think that the most important issue is that we need to be aware of the advantages and the disadvantages of each one of the system that we're trying to develop. This is the most important issue because then we know what are the, what are our limitations. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you all for joining the talk. I hope it was interesting for you. Very interesting. Thank you for attending and, and thank you for presenting, Tarin. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good luck. See you all next week. <laughs>